Aloha, and I am back. I can't believe it. I am finally back recording another Remasculate podcast. And uh, I'm so glad you guys are here. I know it's been a while. I always say that. I've got, got to, got to, got to, got to get better at recording a podcast. I've said I would just sit down and do it by myself if I have to, and I have not done that. Um, I promise I will get better at that. I promise. But, you know, I keep waiting around to get a, a really exciting guest. And I think, ooh, if I get somebody really good and really exciting, it'll draw more listeners to the podcast. So uh, when I get a guy like, like today's guest, I get really excited about having uh, somebody like this on. Today's guest is Paul Ogata. Uh, Paul is a, a comic out of LA. He's actually from Hawaii. He uh, used to own the Honolulu Comedy Club in the Ilakai Hotel in Honolulu. And th- that's where we met. As a com- He was a comic in Hawaii and then was running the comedy club. And we've known each other for years. And he actually, Paul was at my, uh, my wedding. When I got married to Janet, Paul was there on the ship, and he held the camera and videotaped uh, the wedding for us. So any vlog that you've seen on the, the Wrinkled Sheets uh, channel, YouTube channel, see, I don't even know if you guys know that. We have a, uh, a, a YouTube channel called Wrinkled Sheets that is close to a daily vlog. Sometimes it's daily, sometimes it's two or three days apart, but it's, it's like a, a reality TV show. So go check that out. It's called Wrinkled Sheets. You'll find it on YouTube. Um, but Paul was there. And uh, I got Paul to sit down with me on the ship. We turned. It turned out we were working the exact same ship again, the Mariner. And got a chance to get him to uh, to come. Well, I went to his room. I started coming to my room. Went to his room. And you'll hear all about <laughs> his room in in the podcast but you know when you you're planning on doing something i i had my this new boom microphone that has a little stand on it and you can connect it to the uh the phone and it gets better sound and i plug it into my phone and i don't know why it's not working whatever reason i don't know if it was the program that i was using it didn't work it didn't record so we end up having to record this podcast straight into my iphone and it turns out the quality is actually pretty pretty good. But the rest of the story is when I got back to my room, I plugged in the microphone and tried it with another recording app on my phone, and the mic worked. Grr, grr. Don't you hate when stuff like that happens? You don't know why. You don't know how to fix it. You don't know how to change it. It just happens. So uh, let me fill you in with a little bit of stuff since it's been a while since I've done the podcast. Uh I have uh, I have been removed from my <laughs> how, do, how do I say that I don't want to make it sound like a bad thing but um, because I am a conservative comedian uh, I don't talk about that in my act I don't do politics in my act at all but I am kind of a conservative leaning uh, comic I recently got my two annual gigs at the uh, MGM Casino in Vegas at Brad Garrett's Comedy Club. I recently got those gigs canceled because I am a conservative. Yes, I'm actually, isn't that, uh, what are they, what are they, that's that word, isn't that, I'm, I'm being prejudged or prejudiced against me or there's, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? I can't think of it right off the bat right now. But anyway, I have had my gigs uh, canceled. So if you were planning on coming to see me uh, in July, here at the end of July at the MGM, won't be there. And I will not be there in December for Rodeo Week because I've, I've been there for the past five years 
on Rodeo Week. And it's just not going to happen this time. And, uh, oh well, that's just the way it is. Uh, sometimes you got to take a stand. And, you know, I, I believe that uh, I'm taking the right stand by being more conservative and not just uh, giving up. I hope I'm not running some of you guys off that are listening to the podcast like, we didn't know he's a conservative. We can't listen to him if he's a conservative. Well, I won't be preaching it to you on here. It's not what I do. This podcast isn't about this. The podcast is about fun, just having fun. And that's what I want to do every time I crack this mic is I want to have fun with you guys. And I don't want Paul's uh, podcast to be this kind of, hey, uh, I want to open this with a bummer thing. Oh, I want to open this with I had a great time in the ship with Paul. Paul is a great comic, and we will have uh, a lot of fun. Well, we did have a lot of fun. What am I saying? We did have a lot of fun recording this podcast. So here you go. Here's the podcast recorded last week with comedian Paul Ogata. Enjoy. I am sitting here in the beautiful suite. <laughs> this is an amazing room you have here on the ship, uh, Mr. Paul Ogata. I'm here with Paul Ogata, very funny comic. We are working the ship this week, and this room is amazing. How did you talk them into this? Well, it's uh, it's the handicap room. So, of course, it's more spacious. The guy with the wheelchair needs room to move around. Um, I I didn't do anything special. I didn't pull any strings. I just, maybe they looked at me and felt like I needed... Uh, this is man needs a handicap room. That's probably what it was. <laughs> well, this is a gorgeous room. I mean, the the space is amazing. I wouldn't tell anybody that you had a handicap room. I would just say, look at this nice, big room. I've got a junior suite. Yes, a junior suite. So let's go back and find out. Let's find the start of Paul in comedy. Where do you, where do you remember saying, I think I want to be a comic? When I was a kid, I used to see comics on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson all the time. Uh, HBO specials. I remember Rodney Dangerfield's uh, special with uh, Schimmel on it and Sam Kinison, and I remember watching that. Going, that is uh, that looks fun and incredible. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I was always the class clown, so I thought, uh, what well, maybe I could do that. You were the class clown. Yeah, you've always been so quiet as long as I've known you. Other than your your performance that is so good and your writing is so good, you don't seem like you'd be the uh, hey, I'm going to get people in trouble, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I think it was more of uh, uh, how can I get in trouble instead of getting other people in trouble. Or or maybe how can I... Uh, I think it was a cry for help, really. When I really? Was, yeah. <laughs> it was just, how can I get people to like me? Are you a middle child? Or are you a... The second of two. Okay. Second of two kids, and it was just my older brother, who was a year older than me, so of course I had to follow in his footsteps. All the teachers were the same teachers, and they yeah. said... Oh, you're his brother. Why can't you be like him? Yeah. So yeah. I, it was probably lashing out at, at that. And my sister is just the opposite. My sister, my younger sister has told me, oh, you're his sister. We hope you're nothing like him. <laughs> She's told me that. They all go coming up behind you like, oh. Uh, well, then uh, I, I guess it's, it's a bizarro universe. Yeah. I, I myself was always one that would try to talk other kids into doing stuff. So right. I would not be in trouble. They would, but we'd all get a laugh out of it. You know, that kind of, hey, you know what would be fun? Yeah, yeah. If you were to go over and say this to her, you know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You were you wrote for the class clown. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I wrote for the, yeah. You didn't have anybody come up with any of your hair. Here's what you need to do, Paul. Now I got myself in trouble all by myself, yeah. But it, I guess it opened a lot of doors, and it, uh, it was, I guess, a defense mechanism as well. When you're a kid, instead of fighting, maybe you can make somebody laugh. Mm -hmm. That's what a lot of people do that you always hear about. So the bullies, you know, you would make them laugh so they'd leave you alone. Yeah. You got really good at being defensive with the, oh, they'd be, leave him alone, he's cool, you know, leave him <laughs> alone, he's all right. Yeah. Uh, but that translated into... Uh, 
giving a comedy competition a shot in college, and it worked out okay. And that led to working at the, the local comedy club. And that's where I met you all those years ago. Right, it was. And then, next thing you know, you were the owner of the comedy <laughs> club. And yeah, and then that went down in a big ball of flames. And then... Uh, and, uh, and I've heard Paul say before, if anybody wants to know what not to do at a comedy club. Right. It's that old, it's that old cliche. Do you want a small fortune? Start with a large fortune and open a comedy club. Mm, I could see that. Yeah. 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 But, uh, it's where I, I met my wife. She worked at the hotel where I had my club. Oh. And so good things can come from bad things. Always. Always look for the silver lining. Right. Now, were you born in Hawaii? Born in Hawaii. Fourth generation of my family there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't speak Japanese, although I'm ethnically Japanese. My parents don't speak Japanese. I'm pretty sure my grandparents did, but... Uh, yeah. Now, I thought of something I was going to ask you the other day, and uh, I remember you used to use the moniker, the Mental Oriental. <laughs> Do you, do you yeah. very remember this? It was your deal. Yeah. When did you decide, ooh, I probably not, not gonna do that anymore, or? Well, in Hawaii, comedy revolves heavily around, uh, ethnic comedy. Yeah. Uh, racial comedy. Not racist, but racial. Right. Simply because of how Hawaii began with people from many different countries being forced together to live in a, in a plantation situation. So you had Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, Samoans, uh, Native Hawaiians. Uh, Portuguese, all these people had to get along with each other, and they did that through making fun of each other and themselves. Yeah. So that's kind of how Hawaii's comedy evolved. And honestly, I didn't even know I was supposed to be offended by the word Oriental until years later when I, I had gone to the mainland. Uh -huh. Somebody said, oh, you're not offended by Oriental? You're supposed to be. Oriental's a thing, not a person. And I thought, oh, well, I didn't know that in Hawaii, we, that's what you called Asians, yeah. Orientals. Yeah, but I remember I was with you one time, and somebody said something, and you you actually had this comeback of saying, uh, I'm not Asian, I'm Japanese, and Japanese was the Orient. Hmm. I remember you saying, you may not even remember this, but I, I don't. Know. It always stayed with me because it was your, I thought, great, he's explained why he's called himself this. It's like... You're not, you're not, cause Asia was Chinese, like Chinese and Korean and, sure. and I was like, you, you made a great argument. And now you don't even remember, <laughs> I don't remember. you don't remember the, I was like, oh. wow, that was brilliant. Cause that you, like, it's the same thing. There's a guy, uh, I worked with a guy from South Africa and, uh, was it Baron, maybe Carl Baron, I think was his name, Carl, but he had this thing about, I remember him saying something about claiming a whole continent, uh -huh. you know, like, I'm African. You know, I'm from South Africa. And how, how do people claim a whole, whole thing? And I think America really gets into having to have a label on something. Yeah. And it's, uh, you have the hyphens. You have Asian American. You have Italian American. Everybody needs a hyphen. And so when somebody says, you're Asian American, I like to say, no, I'm, I'm American of Asian appearance. So I, I look Asian, but, uh, hey, I'm, I'm as American as the next guy. Right, right, yeah. I, uh, one of my friends that his parents escaped from Cuba, this reminded me because you said fourth generation don't speak Japanese. Right. His parents escaped Cuba when Castro, during the revolution, I mean, they actually were like real refugees, you know, that, like, like 1959, whatever that was. Yeah, yeah wow. And, uh, they didn't allow Spanish to be sp uh, spoken in the house because Oh, as a household rule. Yeah. Okay. Like, we're here now. We, we, we're out. We love America. And I remember as a, as a little kid, I mean little, going over and there was the American flag and there was a picture of like President Kennedy and the Pope. You know what I mean? It was like, we, we are in America. And, uh, Victor and his family, same thing. They've never learned, they never learned Spanish and they're like, I thought you're Cuban. I'm an American. Yeah. But well, that doesn't seem to happen much anymore. I think uh, people come to America for different reasons now. Certainly, they were escaping a brutal regime that they wouldn't certainly they wouldn't want to put up Fidel Castro's picture. Right. Uh, they were escaping that. But maybe with time, you have you can reflect on your ethnic 
heritage. Uh, certainly, you go to a lot of bars in Boston, there's Irish flags up or mm -hmm. Italian flags up. Uh, it's no different, really. But, but I, a lot of them don't speak Italian, or they're just like, yo, my great-great-grandfather came over. They love you know? to think that they do. Right. They don't. Yeah. Really. Uh, Paisano. Yeah. Or they, they love to uh, cut off the last vowel, so it's Paisan. Yeah. <laughs> They've created their own version of the language. Yeah. Yeah, but do, do you ever wish you would knew Japanese? Do you ever feel like, oh, man, I wish I would have... I wish I knew other languages besides English. I'm still working on English. Come on, let's be honest. Uh, but, you know, you and I travel to so many different countries for our job doing comedy that it would be awesome to know other languages. Yeah. So, yeah, I wish I knew uh, Mandarin for when I'm doing shows in China. I wish I knew uh, Tagalog for when I'm doing shows in the Philippines. So you would be like Eddie Izzard and just completely do your act in another language? If, yeah. If you could? Okay. That's interesting because a lot of the comics I know who can do it in different languages tell me that you can't just translate your act into another language verbatim. There's other things involved in the comedy. There's uh, context and there's uh, references so if you were to translate your act into, let's say, uh, Portuguese, yeah. you may you may not be able to do your act in Brazil or in Portugal. They'll understand it, but they it won't be funny. So there's you have to. What do you mean? What do you mean? It won't be funny. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? It won't be funny. No, I I, I hear what you're saying because the words might not be the same. Like yes. like the Spanish word for duck is you know. There's that pato, but pato means something else, and so you know. Right in the Philippines, puto is a uh, uh, a dessert, uh -huh. but in Spanish, puto is male whore. Yeah. So well, there's that. There's there's that. But also, what's funny and how things are funny in different countries uh, vary from country to country. In, in China, a lot of their thing is traditionally has been crosstalk, which is, um, for example, like Abbott and Costello. Mm -hmm. It's it's a two man thing. Right. So if you were just one guy up there saying things. They. they they might not appreciate or understand. Why? Where's the other guy? Because that's not the kind of comedy they're used to. Right. So, and that's changing slowly, of course. There's a lot of uh, comedians who, who speak Mandarin and do comedy in Chinese that way. But, so there, I don't know. Yeah. But I'd still love to get around. When, when I'm in Italy this summer, I want to... Oh, wanna, I know. I want to speak Italian so I can order food. Do you ever watch the commercial for, like, Babel? The learn, learn, learn a new language. Babel. Yeah. You'll have Bill be speaking conversational in three weeks. Every once in a while, I'll see that commercial and almost go, yes, <laughs> yes, I want to know. Yeah. But as, as we found out, sometimes you pay for an app and it's garbage. <laughs> right. We have found that out. Because today, I'll go back this up a little bit. Today was the big, today was the purge of Twitter, where Twitter just killed everybody's count. You lost 12,000 people. Yeah. I lost probably, I don't know what, 40,000? 50,000. 50,000. And, uh, some people have lost 2 million followers. It's like Infinity War. It's the Avengers. Everybody's turning into ash and vanishing. Yeah. So I bought this app to, uh, Tell me who's not following me so I can unfollow them to help the ratio. And the app is crap. It's crap. Yeah. It was a dollar ninety nine. It should have worked. It's a dollar ninety nine you're not getting back. Now, do you remember this is back on the comedy subject, do you remember uh ever performing anywhere before you did Stand up like at at your house was there a party? Did you ever like, as a kid go, hey, watch me on the coffee table? Or? Yeah, well, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a magician, so I had all the magic tricks. Uh -huh. And at family parties, I I do magic shows, and that's what I really wanted to do. I met David Copperfield when I was a kid. David Copperfield got his start in Hawaii, where he had a residency at a hotel. I did not know that. Yeah, and I got to see him as a kid, and I got his autograph on one of those. Gimmick cards that he had, the magic cards, with uh -huh. the disappearing spot trick. Uh -huh. And years later, uh, he came to see my show at the MGM Grand. So it was a nice little uh, 180, nice little... Uh, Did he remember? 
Oh no, he knows. He doesn't remember me oh, okay. as a kid coming to see a show. But he, he remember you say, "Hey, I remember when you used to work over at such he, and such." Yeah, to... he fondly remembers, or maybe not. He remembers anyway his uh, time at the Sacy Bone Room in Honolulu. What hotel was that? It because I don't. It was at the room. Pagoda Hotel, and it was a huge ballroom. And I don't know how or why, but this magician came from somewhere else, not Hawaii, and he started doing a show there. Uh, and then, next thing you know, I'm watching TV and watching this guy walk through the Great Wall of China, watching him make the Statue of Liberty disappear. And you're like, I have seen him make a tiki glass disappear. Yeah. And he was doing really, uh, not, uh, not simple tricks, but not anything grand illusions like you'd see. He was like shoving the scarf and the fake thumb and, yes. and, and stuff. It was you know? the thumb tip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was sponge bunnies. How many? <laughs> That's what he was doing. So he really, which, which you remember, was like, like trick store magic almost. Kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he did it really well. He was really good at it and very talented. And of course, it's no surprise he's doing what he's doing now. Yeah. Now, are you surprised that you're doing what you're doing now? I, I guess. I mean, if someone came back from the future and told twelve-year-old me, "Hey, you know, you're going to be." All over the world, you'll be doing shows for heads of state in different places. You'll be doing shows uh, with Steve McGrew in the Bahamas. Oh yeah, I would not. I would be like, really? What? How? How is this all possible? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, so in that respect, I'm surprised. Well, but you you've had some great because I being friends for years, I followed your career too because we follow each other. You read stuff and. You've had some great exposure. I mean, you've did magazine articles and, and, uh, like the, the press got behind you. Yeah. I, I guess I, I'm lucky in that respect that, uh, it's an interesting story sometimes in some cities, I guess. <laughs> Not so much in others, but, or in some countries. Uh, yeah. It's, we're fortunate, you, you and I, we, uh, to do what we love doing and it, I can't imagine doing any, anything else. Can you imagine? If you weren't doing this, there's a typical question. Typical. If you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? Wow. Well, bef- I quit my day job 12 years ago to do comedy full time. And my day job was a radio show. I had a morning radio show in Honolulu. So maybe I'd still be doing that. But even that was comedy related. I got into that because I was uh, the funny guy. Yeah. Same thing. I was hired as the comic. The yeah. sidekick for the radio show. But that, uh, so I don't know. If before that, what was I doing? I did a bunch of things. I worked at a, a nightclub that, uh, I, I was managing, I was, well, the promotions manager for a, a rock and roll nightclub and then also a gay nightclub. I heard you mention that on stage the other night. Yeah. And I went, I turned to the guy, the sound manager guy, stage manager, went, is that for real? Like, he doesn't know. But I'm like, yeah, I'd never heard it before. You're like, yeah, I used to manage a gay club for a couple of years. Yeah, it was, uh, it's the gay club in Hawaii. So it's, uh, if there's a capital of gay Hawaii, that was the nightclub that I worked at. And it's still around. You can go check it out. It's with beautiful view of Diamond Head. It's right there on the edge of Waikiki called uh-huh. Hula's. Uh, check it out. You don't, you don't have to be gay to go there. It's, you don't, obviously you don't have to be gay to manage it. Yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great view of the beach and of Diamond Head. To me, Diamond Head is the ultimate symbol of Hawaii. Oh yeah. It, I mean, that is, that is it. That's the iconic, uh, and people always tell me, why do I go and waste my time and my vacation on Waikiki? Because I, that's where I stay. Yeah. Um, when I go, I stay at the Aqua Bamboo Hotel. I don't know if you know, <laughs> even know where that is. No, I know where, exactly where that is. I stay at the Aqua Bamboo Hotel. I have for years because I like the hotel. It's a boutique little hotel. Uh, one block up, boom, there's Diamond Hit. And I just prefer that to people that go, oh, you've got to go on the backside of Maui. You're totally alone over... Th- Why do you want to be a Alone. I never understood. Well, I think the problem is that what people think Hawaii looks like is not in Waikiki. What people think Hawaii looks like is, uh, is Kauai, where you have waterfalls, you have, uh, coconut tree plantations, you have... Jurassic Park. Yeah. That's exactly. where they filmed it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that waterfall scene, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, 
But then they get to Waikiki, and it's concrete building, it's asphalt roads, and it could be really any other city. But you have to get out of it. You know, even in, in your case, you have to get a couple of blocks out till you see Diamond Head. Yeah. And, yeah, that's very iconic. Yeah. Straight, same street, come off there, there's the Duke statue. Yeah. So you come out, there's ABC store, then an ABC store, and then the Duke statue. I mean, that's that kind of... But I want to be there. I want to be in what I think of as uh, Blue Hawaii. El- the Elvis background is Diamond Head. The, yeah. the, uh, the Duke statue, just seeing that puts my brain in like, I'm in Hawaii, you know. Funny story about the Duke Kahanamoku statue. He was a, a, a waterman and a, a, a water sports enthusiast uh, and professional uh, surfer. From Hawaii, uh, really, he brought surfing to the forefront of mainstream culture. And so now, on the beach, as you said, there's a huge eight foot tall bronze statue of Duke Kahanamoku, and it's it's majestic. It's, it's larger large. than life. No. But for a couple of years, somebody had put a plaque on the bottom uh, in bronze, uh-huh. a fake plaque that said "Shown actual size." Really? It yeah. stayed there for like a long time? Yes, and so people for a long time thought, this guy was an eight-foot-tall Hawaiian. <laughs> He's bigger than the rock. <laughs> yeah, and uh, they finally discovered the plaque and took it off. <laughs> now, what is the deal? Uh, you may or may not know, but I'm sure you do. There's always seems to be fresh flowers on Duke's arms. Is that something the city does, that the people do? Is it a, an honor thing? or I don't know uh, who's responsible for this. It might be the city. Uh, but it's probably maybe the tourism board or local people who just feel like, uh, they, like you said, they want to honor him. The, there's a lot of that on the King Kamehameha statue as well. The one that's in the front of uh, the Hawaii Five O offices? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There are several, which is not a real agency, by the way, in case it's anybody's not? listening. Yeah. People think that it is, but it's not. I thought it was. I thought they just called the Hawaii police 5-0. Like, 5-0's here. You always hear that, you know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah. 5 O's here. Yeah. No, they. I guess, and that's evolved to become uh, slang for a police of anywhere, really, if, if you're in any city. 5 five O. There is a state police, but it's not called Hawaii 5 O. It's, there's there's not a special task force oh, that a man. Navy SEAL runs. Well, what do you think of the new Hawaii Five O? Well, I I followed it for the first four years or so because I was living in California, and any chance I get to see Hawaii, I'll take. I'm like that too. Yeah. I watch it. It could be a rerun on the ship. I'm gonna watch it, but they're like, oh, I've been there. I get to see uh, all of my friends, people who are. I've known for all my life. Now they're in a TV show. Yeah. It, it, as a cameo, or sometimes yeah. as a repeating character. Yeah. There's a, a friend of mine in radio, Devin Nakoba, who's a, who's always a police officer on there. Oh, really? One of my cousins, Michael Lee, is a, he's the Maui police officer. So if Five O's ever on Maui, they interface with him. him. Yeah. And Augie, like our friend, our friend in comic, yes. Augie T, I've seen him several times playing different things. For the first season, he was the helicopter guy. Ah. Uh-huh. And then, uh, I don't know what happened to that, but, uh, how do they get around now? I, I haven't seen it in a, in a couple of years. Well, I, I have not quit, uh, I've not given up on it yet, but it's, <laughs> to me, it's not as good because they lost, uh, Cohen, Daniel Day Kim. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Grace Park. Park. Yeah. I, I liked them. Yeah. And I don't think, and now it just seems more action oriented. Like they tried to put just more action. Yeah. I feel like they were kind of the heart of the show, uh, and when they left, uh, I don't know, I don't, I didn't even see their final season, so I don't know who replaced them or how they explained their departure. But back in, if you look back on the original Five O episodes, it was like that too. It was like it was a churn of different uh, actors and characters. Uh, Dana was there for most of the time. He wasn't there for all, the whole time. Hey, Dana wasn't. I don't remember. So that's where I was going to go with this. Go, yeah. How does it compare to the old? Episode? Shin Ho got killed in the. Uh, Original series, so he wasn't there. I don't remember that either. Oh, you don't? No, that. I don't remember. Oh. Chino got killed. Yeah, that was a oh, that was a classic five zero episode. You gotta. Oh, I'm gonna have to go back and maybe I'll, like try to find spoiler the spoiler alert. Episode. Spoiler alert for this forty year old show. But that's the other thing I remember about the old Hawaii Five O, which there's still a reruns. You can find them. Is that it, they never were as violent 
as they as these are. You know, they're always like there was a gangster, or it was a bank robbery, or there was a a, a planned art heist, or there was a <laughs> you know what I mean? These are just full out like like just their ATF and yeah. Well, it's also a reflection. It's a mirror to modern society. You have terrorist threats now. You have uh, sometimes you have a nuclear bomb threat, a, nu- a Korean nuclear missile threat, whether it's real or fake. But different things happen these days than happened in the past. Yeah. Like I watched an old episode of uh, Hawaii Five-O just the other day. I watched it on YouTube because I stumbled upon it. And it was all about a violin, an expensive violin. <laughs> you know the episode I'm talking about? Yes, yeah. It was stolen, yeah. and they wanted a ransom for the violin. That was, ep- that was the episode. That Yeah, that's classic 70s TV. But, uh, you know, and they're bringing Magnum P.I. back. That's going to lose. Yeah? What do you think? think so? What do you think? Well, who would have thought that Five-O had uh, so many attempts made at bringing it back? They uh, they tried so many times. They actually filmed a pilot with Gary Busey in the lead, and that was pretty interesting because it was an actual five zero. They were like they, yeah. they were trying to bring the because I've seen shows that are like versions of it, you know, like Cops in Hawaii. But... No, no, this was a Hawaii five zero reboot, okay. and it was actually a continuation of the series, the original series, because the governor was Dano. He actually became governor uh-huh, of the uh-huh, state, uh-huh. and he was assassinated. And that's when Gary Busey's Five O springs into action. Ah. And uh, at the time they were filming, Gary Busey was, I guess the production crew was stationed at the Ilikai Hotel, which is where I had my club. You're right, right. And so I found out that one of the busboys came into Gary Busey's room and said, I am such a big fan of yours, and I'd love to get an autograph, Mr. Nolte. Oh, no! <laughs> and he nearly threw the guy out of the room. <laughs> Uh, but so they shot that and it didn't work out. Uh, it never made it to air. Or no. They tried a, a different one and that didn't work out. So uh, the one that's on TV now is, I think, the third major attempt that they actually filmed. Yeah, and it's like in the seventh, sixth, or seventh season now. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty popular. Yeah. Now here's the deal with Magnum. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Magnum fan again. Magnum. Yeah. Uh, I always liked. Uh, uh, can't, like, that his name, um, Which, mustache. Oh, uh, John Hillerman, uh, Higgins? No, the, the actor, the main oh, Tom guy. Selleck. Tom Selleck. Oh, okay. Tom Selleck. Because, even though he's one of those guys, like, he's a big macho guy, but remember in Magnum, like, he would punch somebody, then go, ow! Yeah. Ow! You know, I always thought that was really cool that, you know, they showed him being vulnerable. He'd be like, ow, that hurt! You know, or, <laughs> yeah. you know. I always like that, and I just think when they don't bring in somebody that at least tries to do that, like I saw the previous, the guy, there's no mustache on him, how do they bring back Magnum without a mustache? Yeah. You know what I mean? There's certain things that are re- required for the comeback. Does he have a Ferrari? Yes, they got him in the car. Does he have a Detroit Lions ball cap? That I don't remember in the... Does he have the shorts that are so tiny uh, you're afraid a ball might pop out? No, I didn't see okay. that. And Higgins is a woman. Hig- of course. You know, in the new version, Higgins, Higgins is a Higgins is a woman. woman. And is there a TC and a Rick? Yes. Okay. But they're nothing like the original. Because Magnum is Hispanic, apparently, in the new one. Oh. Okay. You haven't noticed that? or you seen yeah, it? I know uh, they cast a Jay Hernandez yeah. as the lead. Yeah. So... I don't know. Magnum wasn't Hispanic in the last one. You know what I mean? How, and how does a Hispanic guy have the last name Magnum? I've never met a, a Hispanic guy ever. They named. probably spin it as that was his uh, call sign in the Navy oh. or something. I don't know. I, I've not seen the trailer. I know, trailers. but there's got to be some way. Yeah. And but, then, uh, because of diversity, the uh, Higgins is a, is a woman, and so TC is probably, he's going to be... Uh, uh, a wheelchair bound, uh, yeah, Vietnam vet, asthmatic, or, yeah, albino. You have to plug in different, right? Things. You have to find the social justice thing for that. Well, we'll see if it works. I, I mean, I hope so because more TV shows in Hawaii means more work for Hawaii actors who are my friends. Yeah, and uh, I hope it works out. Oh, crossing my fingers. Wouldn't you love just more? Just any show shot over there instead of like I used to think that about TV. Because everything was set in New York City. Everything. Yeah. 
you might think of a sitcom. They have an apartment near his friends. New York City, uh, mad about you. New York City, why can't they just have a place like Hawaii and be like, hey, it's, it's a coffee shop set in Hawaii. It's a, doesn't it? Set in Hawaii. Yeah, I'd love that. Uh, even, they probably don't even have to film it in Hawaii. Just maybe the exterior shots. But, of course, it's going to be filmed on a sound stage in uh, Los Angeles somewhere. But these, these shows like 5 0 and, and Magnum PI, or Lost even, had to be shot there. Yeah. In fact, uh, I loved watching Lost because you got to see not just Hawaii, but you got to see Hawaii pretending to be other places. You got to see the Bishop Museum as uh, somewhere in London. Oh, good. Okay. But you recognized things. Yeah. As you and were. that was part of the joy for me of yeah. watching Lost is seeing my home state become other places. Beca- the state becoming an actor. Yeah. I never was able to get into Lost. I tried, but I was lost. <laughs> and everyone said you had to watch from the very beginning. You couldn't just go, I don't think I'll watch an episode. Yeah. And you really do have to start from zero on that one. Because it's so confusing. And... Uh, a lot of people didn't like the way it ended. But maybe, is it because of I'm a guy from Hawaii or I'm just a huge lost mark that I loved it? I, you like the ending? Yeah, I mean, it made sense. Sure, there were a lot of unanswered questions, but I'm sure there were a lot of unanswered questions in uh, in any show. Well, let me ask you, since I haven't seen it, it this will be a spoiler, possible spoiler alert. Uh, possible. But... <laughs> Didn't they uh, say that there was going to be all these possible endings, like it was actually in a snow globe, there was, you know, like it was all these weird... Oh, the St. Elsewhere thing. Yeah, there was all this kind of, that it was in an alternate world, or they were all dead, and this was really just a... uh, What was the actual, in your mind, what was the actual ending? Well, the uh, all the way up until the final season occurred in the real world. The final season occurred uh, in an afterlife kind of thing. Most of... Well, it, they split it between the real world and the afterlife. So, uh, in the end, those two things merged, and you got to see what happened to uh, the characters and the island. It, I don't know. Uh, so they were dead. They were not dead, then they became dead. So, but by the end, they were dead. Yes. Okay. In the end, they were, uh, as all things and all people do, they all died. But they were not all dead from the beginning. So a lot of people thought once the plane crashed on the island in the first episode, they were all dead and they were living in purgatory the whole time. That's not true. Okay, that was one of the ones that I'd heard. That, that yeah. was this, the whole thing was, yeah. It, it, sure, it was confusing, but, uh, it was lost. That was, you know what? That was such a groundbreaking show because it was the first real internet show where the internet got involved in the show and they uh, solved puzzles on the internet about, uh, you know, people got together as communities on the internet to try and figure out this show. Yeah, weren't they dropping like e- Easter eggs and stuff for the internet to find and talk about? Yeah. Like they were doing little things that they were like, did you see the thing? It was like an upside down number and it looked like it might have been a... Right. And they'd actually come out with content in between seasons to satisfy people uh, online. Yeah, the internet and their, uh, their puzzle solving abilities. Ah. Now, do you ever see yourself, you live in Los Angeles now. Yeah. Do you miss Hawaii so much that you would ever want to go back? Oh, I miss it every day. I miss, uh, not a day goes by that I don't miss Hawaii and the, the food and the weather and the people. And how I can drive for uh, a half an hour and be in a completely different part of the island. Whereas in Los Angeles, sometimes you drive for an hour, an hour and a half, you're still in Los Angeles. Yes. Because of the traffic. And traffic's bad in Hawaii, too. But, uh, yeah, I do miss it. However, HUD, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, just released statistics that said in Hawaii, $93,000 a year is officially low income for a household. Wow. Yeah. So you'd have to live off your wife's income. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, then I just have to be gone all the time. Well, isn't it... People always say it's so expensive to live there, but I've been there. Don't you just find that you live a little cheaper? Or you live a little different? Live a little... Or is it because you live there, you just have to pay more? 
Well, I guess it's a maybe quality of life too. Do you want、uh, a house in near the city or in the city? And how do I don't know? Do you want to eat out?、Uh, of course, you can live simply anywhere for cheaper. Yeah. But、uh, and again, it's confusing. I don't know if ninety three thousand dollars is the figure for a household of four.、Mm-hmm. Is it just one person? I don't know. I get really get. I, that's the problem with just reading headlines. You yeah, this you, know, you don't get the the real. Well, I read this headline on Twitter, and、uh, <laughs> this is what it said. Yeah. You no, know, because I, I I always hear about people that sell everything and they move to Hawaii and they get a one room place、yeah. and they just you know they, they live off the got, we got some coconuts I went fishing I did some thing made some you know like living very simple but、yeah. that's not the way a lot of people live there is it no、uh, people of course want to eat out every night or、uh, they have to because they work three jobs and they can't cook at home. It's, so you're making this sound horrible. You're、won't. making this. People listening to this would never ever want to move to Hawaii if you keep talking like that. That's my plan. <laughs> Then property rates fall, and I can swoop back in. <laughs>、uh, yeah, but then I heard in the Bay Area, low income is a hundred and fifteen, hundred twenty thousand. So it's I I think it's skewed that whatever the results are for that study is, are skewed. Towards the more expensive and、uh, a, a better lifestyle, or, than than you could get away with. Yeah, yeah. Is there any other place besides Hawaii that you found in your travels that you go,、oh, okay, I might could live here? Ah,、uh, yeah, pretty much anywhere. I love Australia. Australia is a beautiful place.、Uh, things tend to be really expensive there. Also, minimum wage is I think around fifteen dollars or so. So, of course, things are more expensive because of that. Because、uh, it's an island. It's it's a really big island. It's an island.、Uh, I love Hong Kong. I'd live there. It's really expensive though.、Um, Malaysia, I think, has the potential、um, for me and my wife to move to because the food is amazing.、Uh, costs are low, very low. Yeah, and up until recently, the dollar was、uh, fierce there. You could get good,、uh, get a good exchange rate on the dollar. What about Thailand? Ah,、uh, yeah. Well,、uh, I haven't really seen much of Thailand besides、uh, the the seedier parts of Bangkok and Pattaya, but I hear it's really beautiful there too. Because I have a couple friends from Colorado that have ended up. Working and living in in Thailand.、Right? Oh yeah, what? what、uh, one of them is in what's it? Phuket. Phuket. Yeah. Yeah. And then another one just lives and work around Bangkok. But no.、Uh, but they're like, we love it here. The price, the food's you know amazing. The rent's cheap. But but you got to watch out for it. There's always like, but you got to watch out for <laughs> for caves. <laughs> yeah, apparently caves are bad. Somebody roasted a meme the other day that they should, they go if you wanted those boys out they should have let the guy from Subway out of jail to go to go. <laughs> That's those memes like that are always so wrong and rude. Yeah. Okay, but I mean now you can. It's all right. No one died. Well, the the one Thai Navy SEAL, the former Thai Navy SEAL, died, but none of the kids died. So yeah, that's the good thing, right? Yeah. Uh. No, Thailand is.、Uh, I love the food there too.、It、tends to be real spicy.、Um, my personal motto is "Be nice to your butthole. Your butthole be, will be nice to you." But the spicy food will、uh, that'll hurt you. Are you not a spicy? I love spicy food. It just doesn't love me.、Um, do you get、I、sick from it? Or get or do you like? Well, I dated a Thai girl once, and at her family's place, they made a dish, and I thought it was a bell pepper. So I. I Ate it. I bit into it, and it was so hot. I went deaf. Like your ears just started ringing, or something. Yeah, my the inside of my head swelled up. I could hear my hearing slowly going, and then just like you couldn't. I couldn't hear anything.、Uh, it was really bad. Wow. Do you find out what kind of pepper it was? Yeah, the kind that I don't date that girl anymore. <laughs> No, I don't know what she's like. I can't go out with you anymore. Your hair, your head swell up, but now you're not here. I need that. Yeah, and it, her brother was just laughing at me. Just breathe, just bre- oh, just breathe. Okay, that just makes the hot air go into my lungs. Now, have you heard these horror stories about 
that Thailand of like, um, there's always the American guy that goes over and meets a Thai girl and then they get married and buy a house and he magically gets killed by a brother and now the whole house is filled with just the, the, the locals. Ah, uh, well, I'm sure that happens, but it also happens to everybody. So, I mean, have you not watched Discovery, uh, ID? No, I don't think I've seen this show. Yeah, it's one a, of those it's a whole network. It's a whole network of, uh. Like murder shows? Yeah. And it's always, uh, somebody marries another person and they get killed for the money. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a Thai person or if it's, it's an American person. Yeah. That what, happens. One of my buddies that was lived, lived over there said, like, one of the things you learn is that you gotta be careful because these stories happen of like, you know, buys a, a high rise condo for the new wife, but when they find him, he's got a, a high heeled shoe in his eye, but he <laughs> magically just stumbled off the balcony, you know. Right. Well, sure, that happens. Yeah. It happens in America too. <laughs> Just watch yourself. Watch. That's your advice. Well, I always say when people travel anyway, watch yourself. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Or when you get married, watch yourself. Watch yourself. Be careful because there's, there's wives out there. Were you, uh, were you love at first sight on your wife? We, I thought she hated me and she thought I hated her for some reason. Uh, it turns out we met each other a few years before then. We don't eat, uh, don't remember, even remember it until a friend, I said, yeah, remember that time we are at another bar and you guys, you met? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, yeah. And at that point, uh, I walked in with a, you remember Kento? Yeah. Yeah, two of us came from a gig, a comedy gig, and we showed up and there was my wife and her friend. And a mutual friend said, oh, these guys are comedians. And they were like, well, you guys don't look funny. You guys, uh, yeah. Oh, the typical, yeah, you, yeah. yeah. Say something funny. Yeah. Make me laugh. And uh, I was like, okay, well, this is bogus. And we walked away. And years later, I found out, yes, I remember that. Uh, so, yeah, she already didn't like me before. Uh, I thought she didn't like me. And now you you fast forward to you ask her out? Did you... Did, how did this go down? Well, it's, as as Facebook says, it's complicated. But, uh, yeah, I, it, I'd asked her out. And uh, this was during the downfall of my comedy club. So it was a bad time for me, and and because of that, I think maybe I didn't. I kind of pushed her away because uh, who who wants to get involved in this mess? But she stuck around, and so I know it must be because of my personality, not yeah. because of my uh, financial status, my vast fortune. Mm. Now, how did you propose to yours? Was it romantic? Uh, yes. I, this, as I tell it, it is. As she tells it, it's not. Okay, let's hear her version. Ha! Uh, I, get, I, I presented her breakfast in bed, uh, uh, eggs benedict, and, uh, you know, complete with the dishes with the, 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 the cover on it. Oh, there's like a real, the, yeah. the, the, the reveal. Right, and so for dessert, I lifted the, the lid, and there was a ring. And I'd sprinkled rose petals around the bedroom and on the bed. I'm getting tingly. Yeah. But to hear her tell it is, uh, oh, well, she wasn't awake, so I had to sort of sprinkle the, the rose petals on her face so she would wake up. But to her, my wife's version is that I threw the rose, the flowers at her face and said, wake up. She says it that way? Yeah, I, you know. Uh, How long had y'all dated before this? That was, um, maybe three years. Three years, and it was another uh, year and a half or so before we actually got married. And you did this because you knew you wanted to go on the road, and so you felt like, if I could get her married, she'll hang around while I'm gone? No, I, you know, I didn't really think that one through, but she knew that that was kind of what I wanted to do, is leave Hawaii and start doing comedy uh, on the road, as they say, you know, around the planet. And she was down for it, and I'm lucky every day that when I come home, my key works. Every time. I know, I feel the, I feel the same same way. Like, every time I get offered another gig, I think, oh, no, yeah. I've got to go home and say, I got another chance to be gone again. Yeah. And then I have to say to her, what do you think? Do you want me to take this? Do you <laughs> do you do that? Or do you ever, like, I do. do you want me? I mean, I'll say no if you don't want me. No, it's your and job. And sometimes I know she's going to say no, so I don't take the gig or I don't pursue it 
Yeah. Uh, three weeks. This is this will be three weeks away. This trip. This trip. Yeah. And already that's pushing it. Uh, I can't do too many of these in a year. Yeah. But uh, sometimes twenty-one days is a long time to be gone. It is. But sometimes, you know, sometimes I'll be gone for three weeks, and it's uh, off doing a comedy festival here and a another comedy festival there, uh, and a week somewhere else. So I feel like those are, are worth it. This one was kind of this was a last minute change for me. I think this was supposed to be two weeks, but the uh, the cruise line asked if I could do two weeks instead of just the one. And so it became three. Yeah. I try to explain to people who say, you know, ask about how you, how it is when I travel and do my job. It's got to be, I always say it's exactly, it's got to be like a, a truck driver. It has to be the same, you know, you're gone. You do these long hauls. You're, you're, you're gone for maybe, you know, and then you come home and you have to resume your relationship. You yeah. Know, you have to almost put it on pause and then, I'm back. Now, do you want to finish that garden we were working on? <laughs> or, you know, hey, I'm back. Do you want to paint the basement like we were talking about? And you hope that that she didn't finish the garden while you were gone. And, hey, that's another man's cucumber in my yard. <laughs> you you, don't you want do it. not want another man's cucumber in your garden. No, sir. No, sir. But it's a, it's a difficult proposition to be married and do what we do. And a lot of comics will get divorced because of that. Yeah. Well, I've... I've been there. I know how that. I know how that goes. And even even with this one, love you, baby. But um, people will have asked, "Am I worried that that will happen again?" You know, because it's happened before. And I just, you never know what point somebody gets fed up with your lifestyle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because well, that's a good it's point. It's your lifestyle. I uh, wow! I better make a phone call. Uh, Right after this, to make sure that my lifestyle is still acceptable to her. Have you not had conversations about it? When you're like, well, are you okay? Is it starting to bug you a little bit? Do you, yeah. I mean, you... I know that she would rather I be home more, uh, if not all the time, but, uh, this is, this, this is what I do and it pays the bills. So yeah. I'd have to find something else to do first in order to not do this. And very few jobs pay the bills like this does. Right. And allow me to uh, sleep till 10 or noon. Noon or 1, yeah. as I did today. Um, Very few jobs allow you to do that. But they're out there, so... Uh, Very few wives allow you to do that, too. Good point. Even if you were had a job... But, uh, I don't know. There will come a time where I think that'll be the decision I have to make. And then, then I'll have to begin... Looking for something else to do. I'll have to edit. Now I gotta edit that out of the, <laughs> Out of. Or maybe. <laughs> well, you may have heard that. That was the, uh, the wife checking up on me. I'm, I may just leave that in there. Yeah, it came at a perfect time. Perfect it time. Was, We're talking about traveling and the, what your wife thinks and. It was, and that's, you know, my wife has said that to me too before. She, I thought you were, you're dead or something. One night I was in Hong Kong and I had a bad headache. And I went to sleep, uh, and then the next morning I went, woke up early to go see Justice League opening day at the theater. Uh -huh. And my wife was messaging me, messaging, calling me. She said, well, you had a bad headache. I thought you might have been dead. Really? Because you know you're in the movie. Yeah. And not, did you have to finally say something then, or do you... Yeah, and I, uh, so I left the Justice League. On opening day! And... You left the movie? Yeah, I had to, because my wife kept calling me. You couldn't just go, I'm in the movie, I'll call you, I'll call you back as soon as I'm out of the movie. I wish I, I wish I was the kind of person that could talk on the phone during the movies, but no, I'm not that guy. Oh, I hate those people. Yeah. And, and by the way, China's full of them. Hong Kong is full of people who'll just talk on the phone in the movie. So I don't know why I couldn't be like that. That's just, that's just me. That's my inner character. I love the bit you do about Chinese porn. Ah, uh, well. Is is that based in reality, that bit that... Because I don't know. I've never seen any. But with the way you do the bit about... And then he... What, how is it? He, he whispers, whispers to her romantically. Yeah. No. Uh, that, uh, I've, listen, I've never seen Chinese porn. I'm, I'm sure it exists. Uh, uh -huh. I'm, it may or may not be as I describe it. But it's more of a, it's more of a what if. Yeah. Because yeah. it's hysterical. I laugh every time. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And I was standing backstage with the with the... Our headset guy, whatever, can't remember his no, name. No, Derek, the production manager. Yeah. Laughed at you. Ah! He was like, ah! 
Because there's just the way the way you word it with the and he whispers in her ear so romantically. Whatever you love, I love you. I got an angry letter uh, on some cruise. It wasn't even from people on the ship. There were Chinese people on the ship uh, who had complained to a friend on land. And the friend on land sent me an email that said, All the Chinese on the ship hate you. Really? Yeah. Because of that one bit? Yeah. So they're not... As a as Asians as a group, I don't even want this to. I don't know. How I'm trying to avoid this being stereo, <laughs> but it's a not a forgiving thing. Like, oh, he's he's Asian too, so we well, forgive. You know, I think if I was Chinese making fun of Chinese, that might be a different thing. Uh, but I'm Japanese making fun of a ch- you know Chinese thing. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of beef. Well, broccoli. No, there's yeah. a lot of beef and broccoli. You know, I, it's another racial, racial joke. Wait a minute. Um, that was one of the things I noticed in Hong Kong. It was sort of like you were saying about Hawaii. It, and I've tried to explain this to a lot of people in the States. There's a big difference between a racial joke and a racist joke. Yes. And people don't get that. How how would you explain the difference? And then I will say what I was thinking about. Well, as always, it's intent. Uh, is the intent just to uh, inflame tensions and make to deride the other culture, or is it maybe to point out our differences uh, and also celebrate our similarities in, in other instances? Is, is it a good natured joke? And uh, people are. Someone's always going to be offended, even if it's a good-natured joke. Yeah. Uh, I guess, hopefully, there's no malice in what you're saying. But in this day and age, doesn't everything just automatically get taken as, why would you make fun of them? Why would you make fun of that group? Why would you... Yeah, well, there's, you're going to get that uh, more than you used to get it, if you got it at all in the past. But yeah... Uh, it seems like there's an, a culture of offense these days. You want to be offended immediately. Yeah. Like one of the what one of the jokes I remember hearing in in Hong Kong was about uh, Filipino carpet. I don't know if you heard have you heard the, this reference? Carpet, Filipino carpet. They just got some new cardboard oh. laid down. Okay. Now, on the surface, you might think, well, it, it, that seems kind of racist, but it's not. If you look and you dig deeper, you know that uh, most of the households in Hong Kong have a, a helper, a maid, who is usually Filipino, sometimes Indonesian. And on Sundays, it's all of the helpers' day off in the city. All of them. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Filipinos' maids, so Filipinas, yeah. are, are off that day. And they all congregate in public spaces and meet up with their friends who are also helpers. And they sit around, sometimes on walls, sometimes on concrete walkways, but they put out cardboard boxes. So that's probably, you know, that's... The basis for the joke. The yeah. joke. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I understood that, but... And I thought, I thought it was funny, because I had seen that. Yeah, you have the cultural insight into why the joke is funny. Yeah, because I remember, I don't know which local comic it was over there, but it was talking about, I went over to a friend's house, and they had just installed some new Filipino carpet, <laughs> cardboard... And you know the room. The room laughed. Yeah. But it wasn't any. Didn't even hear a, oh, like you would hear. Yeah. You know, over here to be like, oh my god. And you know what? So you're starting to hear a little bit more of that in Hong Kong. Are you? Yeah. But largely, uh, at least in the the audiences who come to my show, they know that it's it's just all in fun. So hopefully, you won't get too many of those. Yeah. I sort of heard that. A little bit, not not even bad, but because your joke is so well done and so well written, was about dating the black girl. Uh, when you first went into the bit, there's a bit of oh, <laughs> like you, you feel like oh, People, what are you gonna say? It's a it's a trigger word uh, for for a guy who's not black to say. So I dated a black girl. Oh, yeah. They're like oh, this something's gonna happen now that I think we should be offended. At. Yeah, get ready, get ready for this. Yeah, but uh, hopefully. People stick through it and realize that it's just a joke. Yeah. Well, I've gotten the joke that I do about I look like a white woman from from the back. <laughs> and I know that because black men hit on me all the time. Right. Black people love me. 
Yeah. They they come up after the show. Nah, but but you you had other people like, I can't believe you say a joke like that in front of me. Like people who aren't black would say that. Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Why are you offended when they when he is laughing his ass off? It makes no sense. It's I think uh for I, I don't know. I'll tell you what happened. In Australia, uh, I was flying out to do a show there on Qantas, which is the Australian national airline, and an Australian flight attendant guy came over, and they give you a menu of what you can choose to eat. Yeah. One was a, a beef stew, the other was Asian chicken, and the guy said, what are you, what are you having, mate? And I said, I'll have the beef stew, and real loudly to everybody, he's not having the Asian chicken! <laughs> So I, I wrote a, a thing on Twitter about that. I remember seeing it. And then some reporter in Australia gets a hold of that and writes a big story saying, uh, oh, this comedian was offended by a, uh, an insensitive... You weren't really thing. offended. You just made a statement about it. Yeah. What I got, or were you offended? Well, first I was uh, shocked. Like, oh, is this guy coming at me like this? This is not the... It, if you were going to joke, maybe come at me in like, oh... You're not going to have the Asian chicken? What? And make a little... What? Yeah. I would have thought... I would have sworn you'd have gotten the Asian chicken. But real loud, like he's performing to other passengers. Yeah. Uh, he said that. And, okay, there's a time and place for comedy. You know, when we're on stage, we're not giving a safety briefing. Right. That's something you do on a flight. Yeah. Just stay in your lane. Do your job. Uh, but, uh, I guess that's that's the culture of of offense, of people wanting to be offended. So this reporter found something and she tried to blow it up into something bigger. And if, well... How big did you let it go? Or did you try to stop her right at that? Like, Well, I spoke to her about it and I said, I really just wanted the guy to make better choices in a flight. Uh, that's all. Yeah. But uh, by the time it got out on the new... Dude, it was in TV, it was in radio, it was in newspaper, I... If you ever want to feel bad about yourself, just uh-huh. wait until a big news story comes out about you and then read the comments. Oh, I've, I've kind of been there a little bit because when I did the, uh, the Friends and Safe Spaces song yeah. with, with Chad that went viral yeah. and we got on Fox News and they were playing it as bumper music mm-hmm. to read the comments under where people would come to YouTube for the song and just write, you, Bunch of racist redneck motherfuckers with the, you know, like, wow, you know, and you're, you're being attacked, like right off the bat, you know, I, I saw your special. I never thought you were funny, but and like, I've always thought I was a little more thick skin, but those can really get to you. Yeah. You know, um, like it was just a song, dude. I was making fun of, <laughs> and you, you've made me out to be, uh, I'm driving the General Lee and putting the next <laughs> Southern uprising again. Yeah. Which, which, those guys weren't even racist, right? The no! No, the car just happened to have the flag on it. They were just two good old boys, never meaning no harm. Yeah, just running moonshine. Yeah, yeah. And then, how, how much have we changed that that was family TV, that they were just a couple of, you know, running from the law. Yeah, we're, we're just honest bootleggers. <laughs> Who are we to, you know? Yeah, well, I, I'm surprised that they made a reboot of that as recently as they did. On the movies? Yeah. I'm surprised that that was fairly recent. Maybe 15 years ago? Oh, it's probably sooner than that, because oh. Jessica Simpson. Simpson was in it. The second one didn't do well at all. You know, they did the first one, but they did a sequel that didn't really... Uh, they did? Yeah, like a director, like director video. Wow. Didn't have the same two... Guys as Bo Duke, you know, Bo and Luke Duke. And Jessica but, Simpson wasn't in it? I don't think she was in it either, well, yeah. Why Why even have a sequel? Why? Yeah. Never could figure out why these boots were made for walking. <laughs> How did that fit into the Dukes of Hazard movie? These boots are made for walking. Yeah, of That's course it had zero to do with it, but uh, for some reason maybe the, the producer owned the rights to the song and... Who knows how Hollywood works. Yeah. Well, when I uh, was talking to Comedy Central, I was telling you this the other day about when I had a chance for a reality show on Comedy Central, and they were, it was going to be follow me at the radio station and my stand-up career, and I had the band at the time, because I was playing, my band was playing at the country bar. Oh. Yeah. And so we were, we'd open for 
uh, like the uh, Let Rascal Flats and we open for Taylor Swift and we open for some of this. And the guy was saying, he goes, this is great because it's going to be like, you know, like when uh, the Osmonds were on the air, the, uh, no, the Osbournes, because they would play a song and then the song would be a hit on iTunes. Ah, Synergy. Because guess Kelly wanted to be a, a singer or yeah. whatever. So he goes, this is great. It's the same kind of thing. Your band can do a song and then we'll put it up. We'll still make money off of the... And none of that ever happened. Come on. This close. <laughs> this, I think that's going to be the name of this podcast this hour. We were this close. Uh, what's the closest? Because this is going to wrap up here. We're 59 minutes, but <clears throat> excuse me. What would you say was your closest to getting fame? Your absolute that you thought this would be the one that will take me to the next level. Well, I don't know that I had anything that would boost me to the next level, but I, there were so many things that could have been promising. Uh, I one time I uh, went to see Fluffy Gabriel Iglesias mm-hmm. at the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas, and I went backstage to talk with him, and he said, "Oh man." You know, and we'd worked together before once in uh, in Los Angeles, and he said, I, "I'd like to get you on my tour next year." For the this is when he was doing the the Fluffy's show on Comedy yeah, Central, the Explosion or whatever. Yeah, was yeah, yeah, Comedy yeah. Revolution. Revolution, and, yeah. And I said, "Oh, that's great! So let let's uh, definitely do that." I'm not, let, I'm not let's do it. it. Let's not do that. But uh, there was a guy who was tagging along with me, and after we left, Fluffy gave me his phone number. The other guy was like, hey, did Fluffy give you the number? Because I feel like I got the, uh, he didn't give me the right number. So I gave him the number and said, uh, this is what I got. And he said, oh, okay. And I think that guy began pestering Fluffy. Gabriel, yeah. And uh, that's probably when uh, Fluffy was like, oh, well, this Paulo got the guy. He's just giving out my number. I'm not going to. Screw it. I don't want to deal with you. Yeah. So. Oh. I wish I could have that one back. And if somehow, if, if, if Fluffy's listening to this, uh, Brother man, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I, don't, I thought the guy, the guy told me that you gave him the number. And I, you got scammed. You I got, got scammed. scammed. I got scammed. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have to, t- when this gets up, we could tag Fluffy and say, please listen to the end <laughs> of this for the apology. I would like to be out on tour with you. Yeah. And Cause well, he did a big special in Hawaii. You could have been, it would have been, it would have made sense. <sighs> But, you know, I get it. And maybe it's another reason. I don't know. But what, uh, for whatever reason it is, uh, he stopped taking my, stopped taking your my calls. messages or calls. So. He yeah. didn't write you one something back like, stop, r- stop it. Don't, no. don't ever write me again. Don't ever. No. And, uh, I'd even offered to, at that time, to give him contacts for people who could bring him to, uh, to Malaysia or Hong Kong before he went out there. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad he finally got in touch with the right people and went out there. Yeah. But, uh, I, yeah, I, oh, if I could have that one. Did, did you, have you heard, did his act work as well there as it does oh, here? Oh, he kills everywhere. He does kills, he? I, I, from what I hear. And it's, if you ever get a chance to see him in concert, it is amazing. It is like nothing you'll ever see. It's a lot like a rock concert. He'll start a joke, hold the mic up, and the entire arena or theater of people will finish the joke for him. Wow! You pay to go tell somebody his own jokes? Yeah. Of course, it's not like that the whole show, but at the end... But he, he will do that? Yeah, just the like... classics. So he'll do the classics. He'll, you guys want to hear this joke? Okay, so he'll start it, and then people will finish it. And it, there's nothing like it. It is... it that When people talk about rock star mm-hmm. comics, that's what it is. So, I always hear that now, that this year... The rock star comic is Russell Peters. So He's that, been that for a while. Yeah. That, that's the same. He, the arena is that people want to hear those jokes. They want to hear the... Oddly enough, with uh, Russell, I hear that people complain that he's not doing different... Oh, like, see, I hadn't heard... Stuff. I hadn't heard that, but I can see, you know... But don't you know comics that are doing the exact same, the exact same act and... Are selling out. I mean, I can I can give you exactly references because people want to see. They bring friends right. to see you, and they'll go. You didn't do such and such bit. 
my friend loves yeah. that kind of dog, and he wanted to hear that. You go to the Stones to hear uh, Brown Sugar. Right. It's always weird when you go to a, a concert, and then the, the band or the singer's like, here's something off my new album, and you're like, we don't care. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> we don't know this song. I went to see Vince Gill one time, and Vince was goes, I'm going to do my entire new album. I'm going to do the new album. And if you wait around, <laughs> I'm going to play all the hits. And it was a great concert. Yeah. It really was. You know, you go, like, I don't know this, but I like that song. It kind of puts you in a different state of mind of like, I don't know this. I don't know this. Because I hate when a band does that. Like, they'll play something, and then they'll go, this is off our new album. And then you go, oh, I guess i got to wait through this to hear the... But if you're a fan of the artist, uh, you'll you'll probably gladly sit through it. Yeah. Um, it's those one hit wonders that you go to their concert and then you're like, nobody knows these songs. Just do your song five yeah. times. Yeah, I saw a band do that one time. I saw a band open with their hit and close with the hit because it was all they yeah. had. Well, they did cover songs and a couple off their album. Start they, strong and strong. Yeah, yeah. Like this podcast. <laughs> That's what we're going to end on right then. Um, tell people how to find you. I always say at this point, this will tell all your social media. And all, all right. Well, you can, uh, on my website, paulogata.com, O-G-A-T-A dot com, or on Twitter, at Paul Ogata, Facebook, Paul Ogata, uh, or Tumblr. It's things that look like buttholes dot tumblr dot com. Perfect. Perfect. I love it. Well, thanks for doing the podcast and, uh, Maybe we'll run into each other again on another one of these beautiful ships in another beautiful suite <laughs> like you have here. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Well, that's our podcast. Thanks for listening. I do appreciate it. And until next time, God bless America. Go bless America. Go listen to some Oak Ridge Boys. I bid you adieu. podcast. Thanks for listening. I do appreciate it. And until next time, God bless America. Go listen to some Oak Ridge Boys. I bid you adieu.